my rock and my redeemer. So the picture of this cross came to me in a text message several weeks back from Lois. She and Doug were traveling through Tennessee and saw this cross. It was suggested that we get one like it to help attract more attention to the church. Although somehow I think the township zoning people might have an issue with that. Now my hunch is that cross is actually some kind of a communication antenna, like a cell tower. We've come up with some very interesting ways of disguising communication towers these days. In Tucson, we came across what we thought was a water tank, only to be told it was actually a cell tower inside that tank. In Guatemala, we encountered this, and if you look, if I, if you look right here, you can see that, that tree is actually broken. And what it is is actually tree bark wrapped around a tower in a public park. So in, in Guatemala, they're able to disguise these things as trees. While well, traveling down south, those of you who have done it know this, it's not uncommon to encounter these crosses. On our trips to Gulfport, we would see these crosses along the route in several different spots. And when I saw that picture, I was reminded in particular of an experience during our trip in 2009. In 2009, there were 40 of us on the team. To get that many of the people to Gulfport together, we rented two 22 passenger buses. Now our fleet that year also included a crane, a box truck, a 15 passenger van that was being donated by another church that we picked up the day before we left to take it with us to Gulfport, and the pickup truck belonging to our team's project coordinator. So to have enough drivers for the buses, a couple of us obtained our Class B commercial driver's licenses. So we leave on a cold, snowy January Saturday morning to start our convoy to Gulfport. On that first day, we will be traveling to Cleveland, Tennessee, south of Knoxville. So as we continued traveling south, the snow began to change to rain. The rain was light at first and got heavier as we continued south. So at the Virginia-Tennessee line, we made the decision to not stop for dinner, to push all the way through to Cleveland. And I got behind the wheel of one of the buses. Day turned to night and the rain grew heavier. As we were traveling through the mountains of Tennessee, we are not only dealing with the rain, but now we're dealing with a heavy fog. Think 380 and 940 when it gets fogged up. It was this trip where I really learned to appreciate the reflective paint that they use on roads because quite frankly for several miles that's the only way I knew I was still on the road was by that paint on the road. Now I don't mind telling you I was on edge, scared. Along with that trip home, Along with the trip home from Bethlehem during that first nor'easter back in March, this was probably the worst driving experience I have ever had. The difference being, when I came home from Bethlehem, it was just me in the vehicle. On this trip, I had all those folks sitting behind me that were relying on me to get them safely to Cleveland. One of the people on the bus said, Mike, we are praying for you that you are able to get us to our destination safely. A few minutes later, we rounded a curve heading up the mountain, and what do we see but one of those crosses? Shining brightly through the fog. My passenger didn't miss a beat. He said, Mike, that is not the destination we were praying for. <laughs> Eventually, the rain stopped, and we made it to Cleveland. After a little bit, and maybe a whole lot, of decompressing, I got back behind the wheel and took a group of us to a restaurant for dinner. A short drive that I assure you was much more relaxed because when we got to Cleveland, for that day anyway, we had reached the other side. So Jesus is teaching beside the sea and drew a sizable crowd. The crowd grew that large that he got into a boat on the sea and taught from there. And imagine he did it without a public address system. He spends the day teaching and then the evening comes and Jesus says, come on. 
Let's go to the other side. Now, there's a curious phrase in the middle of verse 36. The text tells us that they took Jesus with them just as he was. Jesus didn't need to change clothes, freshen up, or get something to eat. He didn't need to update his parable notes or make other, any other preparations. Jesus would go to the other side looking and feeling just like he did then. And not only was Jesus going just as he was, he's going at night when it's dark. He wasn't waiting until morning when it was safer and the disciples could see the environment around them. There's a sense of urgency here. Jesus wants to get to the other side, and he wants to get there as soon as possible. So they're crossing the Sea of Galilee. Now, scholars tell us where they are crossing is roughly 700 feet below sea level. It's surrounded by steep cliffs and mountains. Hot air rises, cool air falls. And the hot air and the cool air keep wanting to switch places. Cool air wants to get down there closer to the water. And when that happens, it results in high winds and waves that can top 30 feet. So when you look at that sea on the map of Israel, it looks like a little lake. But think about it when you're in that fishing boat, 27 feet long with 15 people. That fishing boat. You're in that boat, that sea's pretty big, especially when you're dealing with substantial storms and waves up to 30 feet. And remember, at least four of the people in that boat with Jesus were experienced fishermen. They survived storms and sea, and chances are they know people who have not. So these people who are strong, self-reliant, they'd be able to handle any kind of moderate storm, any kind of moderate danger. Well, just by their reaction, they're telling you this is not the stuff they're typically used to dealing with. This is dangerous. This is deadly. So like my fear driving that bus on that rainy, foggy Tennessee mountain, the disciples are justified for being afraid. And Jesus is sleeping. After Jesus tells the disciples to go to the other side, he went to the back of the boat. Yeah, it said in my translation, stern. I had to look that up to make sure that that was the back of the boat found a pillow, and went to sleep. Now, what you don't see in this picture, but scholars believe existed, they believe that in the back of the boat, there was a platform. And the helmsman, the person that was steering the boat, stood on that platform. And Jesus was laying on a pillow underneath that platform. Jesus was sleeping. So while all these experienced Sailors are panicking as they're trying to row through the wind and the waves. Jesus is sound asleep, despite the wind, despite the waves. Did you ever try and sleep on a roller coaster? <laughs> Never been on a roller coaster. There you go. It's their first test. Up until now, the disciples have been observers and followers. They've been watching as Jesus taught, as Jesus healed, as Jesus withstood challenges from the Pharisees and the scribes. Now it's time to see what they've learned, to see if they realize who Jesus is. The disciples wake Jesus. Teacher, don't you care we're about to die? Don't you care? Did you hear the questions? The question? The disciples ask. Now, if you read Matthew and Luke's version of this, they wake Jesus up and they say, save us! Yet in this gospel, it isn't a plea. It's a rebuke. Don't you care? So how many times have we found ourselves in a situation of some short sort and we yelled out at Jesus, don't you care? Have any of us prayed a panic prayer to God who appears to have abandoned us, like when driving through a blinding rainstorm in the mountains of Tennessee or a blizzard 
or any other kind of hazardous event we may have faced in our life. Jesus wakes up and rebukes the wind, just like he rebuked the evil spirit in chapter 1. The wind and waves stop. The sea is calm. Jesus looks at the disciples and says, well, why were you afraid? Don't you have any faith? Now think about what your reaction would have been at that point in time. Does the disciples' fear go away? No. Now they're not afraid of the storm. Now they're afraid of Jesus. See, they said, who is that man that even the sea obeys him? And while we heard in the translation Pat read and in a couple of other translations, they were filled with awe. Scholars believe a better translation is fearing a great fear. And there's only one other place in the entire Bible where you see the phrase fearing a great fear. And it's in the book of Jonah. See, Mark's writing to a community that must have felt like the crew of a storm-tossed ship, facing persecution and feeling small against powerful and unfriendly forces, just like the disciples on the sea and the crew taking Jonah to where he did not want to go, to where he was not supposed to go anyway. Mark's writing to strengthen their faith and their trust in God's goodness at work beneath the surface of every storm and every trial. So while Mark's first audience was that early church, is Mark writing to us as well? With the calm sea of Galilee, the journey continued. When the journey ends, they're on the other side, in the land of the Gentiles, and they are immediately greeted by the man with the unclean spirit named Legion. We made it through that storm and arrived at the hotel in Cleveland, Tennessee. I was behind the other bus pulling into the hotel driveway. When the other bus stopped at the entrance to the hotel to allow its passengers to get out, it died. We could not get that bus started. Well, now we're facing another storm. The only way we all made it to Gulfport together was because of that 15-passenger van we picked up the day before we left. If not for that, we would have been scrambling. But there are other lessons we learn from the disciples' trip across the Sea of Galilee and from that 2009 trip to Gulfport. We certainly learned on that trip that when we leave our family and friends and everyone else behind to follow Jesus... <coughs> We're not guaranteed a storm-free life. Now, if we didn't learn that on the trip down, the ice storm we encountered in Virginia on the way home certainly made sure we got the message. I don't ever, ever ask Jesus to wake up, but there were many times on that trip when I said, really, Jesus? But there are other lessons. Pastor Mita Stamper reminds us that following Jesus may take us straight into encounters with the worst pain and suffering in the world. It was difficult for me, me to read the comments of my colleague, Reverend Randy Meyer, as he shared his recent experience at a compound near the Arizona-Mexico border. In my 20 years here engaged in frontline immigration work, he said, this was probably my most difficult and hopeless day. That year in Gulfport, it was disturbing for our crew that someone was living, to learn that someone was living in that trailer. And along with the folks living in these trailers, they were sharing the one working bathroom in the house we were working on that sat on this property. A bathroom that we would not use. We had a job Johnny brought onto the site for us. See, here's the thing. Even for us, who know at the, how the story ends, which the disciples in the storms did not. Crossing to the other side at Jesus' command may try our faith. 
but it also puts us into a position to experience the stilling of storms, the restoration of the broken and the marginalized, and the transformation of death to life. So how are we being asked to cross to the other side? What storms might we confront as we cross, and what might we encounter when we reach the other side? Global Ministries is now ready to accept teens to help in the recovery efforts in Puerto Rico. They're looking for groups of up to 15 people to help with the cleanup and the repair of homes and church properties, and to walk with the people of Puerto Rico while doing the work. Like we used to say, it's healing hearts and healing homes. And believe me, sometimes the healing homes is the easy part. But know this. No matter how we are being asked to cross to the other side, no matter where that journey will take us, God's presence will be with us, not only on the journey, but while we are doing God's work on the other side. Amen.